Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the 2014 U.S. Midterm Election Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Michael Ector, Director of Corporate Communications and Marketing for MSL Group in North America, you may begin your conference. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce Stan Collender of Corvus MSL Group. Um, as many of you ha know, Stan has been very closely tracking the um, U.S. midterm election this year. Um, you may have seen him this morning uh, guest hosting on Bloomberg TV or heard him on NPR or many other places uh, in the media over the last several days. Um, Stan is one of the nation's leading experts on the U.S. Um, US budget and the congressional budget process, U.S. monetary policy, uh, and Congress and Wall Street's response to Washington's tax and spending policies. Um, he is one of only a handful of people who have worked for the House and Senate Budget Committees. He's also a regular contributing columnist to Forbes.com. Dan? Mike, thank you, and thank you, everybody, for uh, dialing in today. Uh, I don't want to go over too much of the actual numbers from last night. I'd rather talk about the implications, but let's just say the following to get started. Uh, this was a unexpectedly large victory for the Republican Party uh, on almost every level you could possibly imagine, uh, not just the Senate and House, uh, the Senate uh, with the additional seats, but uh, the additional governors, including in some very blue states like Massachusetts and Maryland, state legislatures, which went red. Uh, and uh, so, you know, there is a there was what, what undoubtedly uh, can only be con can only be clar excuse me called a wave election. Um, this was not an anti-incumbent vote. This was an anti-democratic vote, or as many people are interpreting it as an anti-Obama vote. Um, the key question, though, is what does it mean? Uh, whether you've got legislation you want to prevent from happening or legislation you want done, whether you think the country needs a new direction or, or, or you know, would just like to get everybody together to do more, does this mean that the world has changed? Does it now mean that uh, members of Congress on the Democratic side in particular are chastised by these losses um, and are now going to join hands with their Republican brethren and sing Kumbaya? Uh, the answer is a resounding no. Uh, in fact, in spite of the big numbers, and I'll explain why in a moment, in spite of the big numbers uh, that the Republicans have won, um, or gained, excuse me, uh, we don't see a whole lot changing. And in fact, the stalemates, the, the policy stalemates, the political stalemates that have been so frustrating to Americans, at least according to the uh, exit polls released last night, um, the, the frustrations that Americans felt are likely to be intensified over the next couple of years. Uh, let me get into that in a little bit of detail. Number one, keep in mind that the 2016 election started at midnight last night. Uh, that was about the time when uh, Republican takeover of the Senate became uh, clear and uh, secure. Uh, but all the statements you've seen made by uh, Republican leaders, by Republicans in general, uh, you know, um, or uh, are all at least talking, or at least directed towards the 2016 election. I know there's a certain amount of fatigue about elections at this point, but believe it or not, there's only about 750 days left before we, the voting takes place, and that's a presidential year, so it'll get pretty intense. Um, that means that the next two years are going to be pretty intense politically as well. Uh, and a lot of what the Republicans will be doing over the next couple of years when they're in control of both houses of Congress is not necessarily to get legislation enacted, in spite of some of the statements that were made, but to put, pro provide to pass legislation that will be sent to the White House that the president will veto. And here's what you need to understand. Yes, the Republicans will have perhaps a 57-43 majority when all is said and done in the Senate. Um, and yes, they will have picked up 12 seats or so in the House. But in neither the Senate nor the House will the Republican pickups give them enough votes in the, to, to override a presidential veto. You need a two-thirds vote of each House voting separately, and the Republicans will not have that. Um, so their choice will be to either 
come up with a plan that's a compromise with the president, accommodate some of his wishes so that he was willing to sign it, or send him legislation that he's not willing to sign that he vetoes and therefore have an issue. Um, at this particular point, uh, it looks like the issue is winning, winning out. In fact, if you heard uh, um, uh, Paul Ryan, the uh, incoming chairman of the uh, Ways and Means Committee, the, the outgoing chairman of the Budget Committee, he said last night that uh, they were only going to go so far in accommodating the president and instead we're going to insist on their principles. Uh, this is very much in keeping with something I heard and first learned in February 2011. I was the first speaker at the first meeting of the House Tea Party Caucus. And one of the things I will never forget is the Tea Party chairs from Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida who spoke after me said to the 20 or so Tea Party members who were there, quote, compromise is a sin, unquote. That's an exact way they phrased it, a sin. Um, they also said that working with the other side, working with the Obama administration was, quote, collaborating with the enemy, unquote. This is, a, this, this is not a group of folks who even have the permission from their own voters to compromise and collaborate. Um, so I think you're going to see that, that the stalemates that have happened over the last couple of years will continue. They may be different. That is, instead of the House passing something and the Senate refusing, or the House passing something and the Senate passing something different and the two bodies refusing to, to work with each, with each other to try to compromise, what you may see is the House and Senate coming up with a bill, they send it to the White House, the, House, the President vetoes it, and the votes don't exist to override, and so in spite of the fact that legislation has been enacted, nothing happens. Um, there is another reason that you should, uh, you, you should keep in mind that not much has changed. There will be tremendous differences between the House and Senate Republicans over the next couple of years. The House, with its 12 additional Republican seats, has gotten a little bit more conservative and a little bit more Republican, and it was already more conservative than their colleagues in the, in the Senate. Um, yes, Many of the senators, like Joni Ernst, Ernst of uh, Iowa and uh, Tom Cotton of, of Arkansas, are more, cons or more conservative than the people they replaced. And yes, some of the other senators who replaced retiring Republican senators are more conservative than the ones they replaced. But, and this is what's important, in 2016, 24 of the 34 senators up for re-election will be Republicans, making them politically vulnerable making votes on a lot of the very conservative things that the House wants them to vote on politically untenable. What will make it more difficult for the Republicans who are up for re-election to vote for some of the things the House wants um, is the fact that many of them represent blue states, states that Obama won uh, at one point or another. And so it was always going to be a difficult re-election for them to begin with. It will be made more difficult if their Republican colleagues in the House force them to walk the plank on such issues as Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and some other things like that. Uh, politically difficult votes. What happens if Mitch McConnell, the presumed incoming Senate Majority Leader, the one who will replace Harry Reid, what happens if Mitch McConnell decides to try to protect his, quote, moderates, unquote, moderate Republicans? Well, that would create a new challenge for him. It means that Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and, and some of the other uh, you know, some of the other Tea Party senators will, will threaten to bolt and may very well vote against the more moderate package that, M that McConnell tries to come up with to protect his people. So you've got this interesting dynamic. It, it almost makes the Democrats irrelevant because it, the real discussions will be between House and Senate Republicans, and the discussion will be not only is there something we want to do or can do, but is there something we want the president to sign or veto. Uh, my guess is that over the next two years, you're going to see little substantive legislation, um, that the economy will roll along but not get a big boost from anything that Congress is doing, um, and that it, with the exception of a very few series of issues, um, it'll be more of the same. Uh, what type of issues? Well, ironically, the president has been trying to get fast-track trade authority from the uh, Democratic Senate. Harry Reid has prevented that from happening. Republicans are in favor of fast-track authority, so he, the president may very well get that. Now, that's that's a rational argument, not a political one, and time will only tell. Uh, the same thing is true with uh, the Keystone Pipeline. Um, that is also something that he may get more, uh, have a more favorable treatment from the Republicans. But if you're asking about judicial nominees, ambassadorial nominees, uh, nominees for cabinet and sub-cabinet positions that require Senate confirmation, the overwhelming likelihood is few 
maybe none of them will actually get confirmed over the two years. That could create a huge problem, especially in the judiciary. Uh, judges die, judges uh, retire. Uh, there are four judges in the Supreme Court that are over 70 years old. Um, if one or more of them decides to leave, it is unlikely that the Republican Senate is going to allow Obama to name a federal judge and then confirm them. He can name them, but he can, they won't confirm them because federal judges serve for life and therefore would, would, would last long beyond the, the Obama term. So the bottom line for all of this, and then we can try to take some specific questions. The bottom line for all of this is that not much has changed. Yes, the numbers are dramatically different. Yes, the Democrats are hurting. It's, the, it's, the, it's one of the biggest losses for a party in American history. Uh, Republicans will have more seats in the House at any time since Harry Truman was president in 1948. Does it mean, does it usher in a new era of bipartisanship? The answer is almost certainly no. The only two things that could change this would be either some huge crisis that allows a member of Congress, Democrat or Republican, to move from his or her established position, something where his or her constituents would say, we know you told us you wouldn't do this, but it's okay, you've got to deal with whatever this is, or and or a charismatic leader who can take advantage of this uh, crisis situation. The problem I have with them, and this is the way it's done throughout, been done throughout American history, and this is what's changed the outlook. The problem is we've got crisis fatigue in this country. We've had so many big crises, things that have been almost unimaginable, like 9-11, Ebola, and some of those types of things, uh, the financial crisis. It's hard to imagine a crisis being big enough and worrisome enough that the average American wouldn't, would simply give his or her uh, representative or senator the ability to move from their position. Instead, they're more likely to point the finger and say, it's your fault, whoever the other person might be. And the second thing is, I'm not sure I see on the horizon the kind of charismatic leader um, who can take advantage of this situation. Um, so until one or both of those things happen, I think we'll be muddling through for the next couple of years. So with that in mind, Mike, can we try to take some questions? Sure. Uh, operator, uh, can you see if there are any questions? At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. We will pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And Stan, while we're, while we're waiting, um, could you talk a little bit about what this means to the PR industry? Um, yeah, it, it, interestingly enough, it should provide a variety of additional opportunities for us. Um, and for our clients. Uh, clients are going to need to communicate to new people up on Capitol Hill, that's staffers and members. Uh, you'll have new new reporters will be getting uh, different beats covering different folks, but the issues will have to be relitigated. Things that have been hanging around on Capitol Hill but not, be, not being dealt with um, will get some new life. It may only be hearings, it may even be a, a bill being debated and, and, uh, and not going through but um, there will be a need to not just sit back and assume that people understand what you've done before. Um, in addition, you've got a, a new Congress that's much more digital media savvy. They, they use media in ways that hasn't been done before, and certainly not when I came. When I first got to the Hill, we were just trying to get a press release fax. It would take four minutes a page, and we had to take the receiver and put it in a couplet. And we were just trying to get it out to get to, to beat the evening, the afternoon newspaper deadlines. Um, now, in, communications is instantaneous. Members want data. Uh, so it, it groups want data, um, and, and they want their, their members to be able to communicate directly with members of Congress instantly. So um, there, there should be lots of opportunities, and we, we need to get out there and, and explain what, what, what has to get done. Great. Uh, operator, it looks like we have a question. Your first question comes from the line of Paul Newman with MSL Group. Your line is now open. Stan, it's Paul here. Firstly, congratulations on being so lucid with so little sleep. I know you're working through the night, and I also caught you on um, Bloomberg TV this morning. My question is one around communications. Um, which of the parties communicated well or not, and anything we can learn, because there will be many communications um, experts on this call, any communications lessons out of what happened? Uh, well, Paul, I'm going to need a couple of more days to, to, to figure out exactly what, what happened communications-wise. One of the things we do know is that uh, the Republican get-out-the-vote effort matched what Obama did in 2012. Uh, if you, may, you may remember that after the Romney campaign, there was a lot of criticism about how 
that campaign just just didn't have the uh, technical wherewithal to match what Obama was doing. Um, that there were a lot of folks in the Democratic side who were relying on on that advantage this time, and it didn't show up. And that's because uh, through social media and through a variety of big data collection, uh, through through the, the uh, through a system of being able to communicate with their volunteers, the Republican Party in a variety of states um, was was able to uh, have a, a, a far more effective communications plan that didn't rely on on just phone calls, but on on data collection. So um, I suspect what we're going to hear when this is over is that uh, the move towards digital communications and political campaigns has accelerated um, and that there'll be a race for 2016 to see what the next big step is going to be. Um, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for professionals like us uh, to try to lead, to lead the way and try to understand both what their needs are and how they can be met. Thank you. So, Sam, you know, this, this has been a year where MSL Group has communicated a lot about millennials um, and how uh, millennials are active citizens. Was there any indication last night that millennials um, turned out in large numbers to vote, or is it still too early? Yeah, for that? actually, Mike, it's just the opposite. Um, the traditional pattern is that the younger you are, the less likely you are to be registered and vote. Um, there was some think thinking that millennials, given how concerned they are about their own future and about the economy, um, would break that pattern. Uh, the exit polls last night showed, and this was last night, that once again, that age group was the, was the lowest vote, it was the lowest demographic in terms of percentage of voting. Um, it was less than 15%. By contrast, 50% of senior citizens voted, of those, of those who were registered voted. Now, that's again, that's a very traditional pattern um, where the younger you are, the less likely you are to vote. Um, and, 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 and one of the things we don't know at this point is how big the turnout was overall. Uh, it looks as if um, white males over 65 voted in higher percentages of this election than they have in the past. Women voted in slightly smaller percentages and, and didn't vote as high for Democrats as, as they have in the past. But the millennials just didn't, didn't take part in the political system. And my guess is it's going to re result in their continued disaffection from it. That is, they, you know, that, that they're not going to be energized by the changes. They're going to be, you know, uh, they, they're, ju they're just going to say, look, I didn't participate. I didn't care, um, you know, and I'm not going to participate the next time either. Typically, you've got to get to be 29 to 30 before you start to get there. So you had mentioned the, um, the importance and the impact on the trade agreement, but is there any other, um, uh, is there any uh, or fast track tr uh, mm -hmm. trade, uh, 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 the trade fast track trade? But are there any other impacts globally for, um, you know, uh, many of our companies that are our clients that are running global businesses? Well, look, the biggest thing that I, I've been asked for the last 24 hours um, by clients and by people at MSL is what about tax reform? Uh, what, excuse me, specifically, what about corporate tax reform? Uh, is there something that's going to happen about tax inversions? That's, the, that's the, uh, the tax strategy the companies use to store money overseas and, don't, and, not, and not repatriate it. And what, what, what the hope is is that a lot of companies will have the opportunity to bring the money back into the United States at low tax rates, you know, very, very low tax rates. Um, I, I need to be as specific here as possible. While it's certainly possible that Congress would take up tax aversions, inversions uh, by itself, it's far more likely that they're going to do it as part of a comprehensive tax reform package. Uh, maybe only corporate tax reform, but I suspect that um, there'll be a lot of members of Congress who will refuse to take up corporate tax reform unless it takes up individual tax reform too. The last time we had a big tax reform package was in the 1980s. It took three years when life was a lot simpler when there was no Rush Limbaugh or Rachel Maddow or social media or Tea Party, uh, when the bill was going to be revenue neutral from the beginning. Um, we don't have any of those things now. There, there's, there's going to be a push for revenue positive. That is to gain revenue. We have social media. We have cable television. Um, we have the Tea Party. Uh, if it took three years in the 1980s, I'm guessing it's going to take at least three now. Um, that that uh, the only way it will happen is after the 2016 election. There'll be some discussions about it, but um, this is one of the big issues for our clients, uh, you know, a corporate tax reform. 
and I suspect it's just not going to move forward very much. There just isn't enough consensus for, to do much about it. Plus, and let me be very, very, very cynical, the longer members of Congress can keep it alive, the more likely they are to collect political donations from those who want to influence the process. Thanks, Dan. Let me remind our listeners that if you have any questions, to please, um, please indicate that. Um, and operator, that's by pressing 1. Star 1 on your telephone keypad if you would like to ask a question. Terrific. And, and Stan, um, while we're uh, seeing if there are any further questions, um, can you talk about the Affordable Care Act? Are the Republicans going to try to repeal it? Will it have any traction at all? Oh, um, what is a, that going to add? It's a great question. It's also one I've been getting all day. Um, the answer is certainly there will be some effort or efforts by Republicans to repeal or replace or do away with parts of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Um, if you remember, the House voted 50 times or so over the, over the last two years to repeal it, knowing full well that the Senate was never going to take it up, and if the Senate did and passed it, the President would veto it. Um, that same dynamic pretty much exists here. Uh, the House is almost certainly going to try to repeal parts or all of uh, Obamacare. Uh, the Senate may this time pick it up uh, and, and, and go along with what the House does, and it is impossible for me to imagine the President signing legislation that would do away with one of the signature legislative accomplishments. Now, there is a process that can be used. In fact, Mitch McConnell has talked about it. If Congress can agree on a budget or a budget resolution, something it hasn't done for five or six years, it can use a process known as reconciliation to consider eliminating parts of the Affordable Care Act. Not all of it, just parts of it. It, has to, it can only deal with the parts of the, budget, uh, parts of the Affordable Care Act that have budget implications, that spend or tax money up or down. Um, the problem there is, I mean, well, the good news about re reconciliation is that it can't be filibustered. It, it's a simple majority vote. There's a limited on time, and after the time is up, you take a vote on it, period. But the bill can be, uh, can be vetoed by the president. So the bottom line to your question, Mike, is I think there'll be lots of smoke on this one. Uh, you know, it is something that Ted Cruz and others promised last night that they would take, it, uh, take up as, a, as, as almost a first priority. Uh, but I don't think it'll be successful. In fact, I'm pretty sure it won't be. That um, if the only way you're going to get Obamacare out of there is after Obama's ter term is over. And by then, enough people may be on it that it'll be impossible to take the benefits away from them. Thanks, Dan. It looks like we have another question. Your question comes from the line of David Close with MSL Group. Your line is open. Hi, Stan. Really, really hey. interesting analysis. Uh, I'm curious about something to see if you have any thoughts about it. There's been so much written about uh, the dark money in this election and that this was really the first uh, large election after the Supreme Court kind of uh, helped enable that. Did you see evidence that all of the dark money really, I guess, on both sides uh, made a difference or was it sort of self-canceling? Um, well, it's dark, so I haven't been able to see it yet. Uh, right. um, there were some reports that a number of uh, nonprofit groups sprung and, and super PACs sprung up in the last two weeks, last three weeks of the campaign, so late that um, uh, you know they wouldn't have to report until after the election about uh, you know uh, about what they spent their money on and who they got uh, uh, their their uh, their funds from. Um, the reports were that they had spent literally millions of dollars on uh, on TV advertising, in particular, in a lot of key Senate races. I can't imagine that didn't have a, a uh, an impact. I mean, I live in Virginia. Uh, I saw all the commercials uh, that were pro uh, Ed, Ed Gillespie uh, and anti Mark Warner. Um, I know Mark, and I and I know how much money he had to spend, and and I know a lot of it was coming from other places. But but to and to to be to stop beating around the bush, Dave. I don't know who had the, the the advantage. I mean, you tend to think that it's coming from uh, uh, the Republican side, uh, but we don't know that for sure. And in fact, Haley Barber last night was being interviewed on CNN and said that Democrats had more money. Now, you would expect that from Haley Barber. He's a former Republican uh, National Committee chairman and former Republican governor of Mississippi. So he's not necessarily going to be objective about it, but that information will probably come out over the next two or three weeks. But let me, let me, um, let me, let me just uh, add something to that. Will this change anytime soon? Will, is there any chance that the Supreme Court will review these decisions over the next couple of years? And the answer is no. Thanks, Dan. 
So you mentioned that the um, 2016 presidential election started last night. Mm -hmm. um, what does uh, yesterday's results mean to the various um, potential candidates, unannounced candidates yeah. that, that we've heard about? Um, how does uh, how has the playing field changed, and you know um, what what do you think might happen yeah. next? Well, let me give you a little historical perspective. Uh, traditionally, throughout American history, uh, American voters have turned to governors when they've looked inward. That is, when the problems haven't been international relations or military, uh, but more uh, everything from uh, uh, recessions to depressions to uh, you know to, to infrastructure problems, those types of things. Americans have, tip, have typically turned to governors as a presidential choice. Um, that bodes well for the Republicans. You had many, many Republican governors and Republican candidates win governorships last night. Um, the two most interesting, who become very, three most interesting, assume we become either very viable or more viable candidates uh, for president, are John Kasich, the, uh, the big winner in Ohio. He's reelected. Uh, I know him from when he was chairman of the House Budget Committee. And he's a more moderate, but he's a fiscal conservative, but a social moderate. I don't know whether he can get the nomination, but he, he it was a big victory in Ohio, and that should propel him forward. Uh, the second was Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, who's now won, uh, I think it's three elections in the last four years, including a special election. Um, and and although he's had some problems there, uh, and the union hate him, you can't deny the fact that the man has been able to stay uh, and, and, and is likely to be looking... Uh, to run nationwide, or at least to explore it. The third governor you, ha you can't ignore at this point is Chris Christie, not because of who he is as a governor, and certainly not because of some of his recent problems, but because he's chairman of the Republican Governors Association, and he campaigned for virtually every Republican governor who won last night, making, it, making him somebody they're beholden to, and it, it propels him forward. Um, on the, it, there are two other things I should mention, though, and then maybe this is a good way to close the call. Um, I am convinced that one of the big losers last night was Mitt Romney. Now, he wasn't on the ballot. Uh, you know, he, he, he did campaign for some people, but over the last several months, he's, he started to hint that he, you know, he, although he said he wouldn't run for president again, he might be willing to consider it. But with the large number of additionally viable Republicans now, you know, available to run for president, the likelihood that the party will turn back to Romney as their savior, um, or for that matter, to Jeb Bush, became dramatically less last night. There are too many others, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, uh, the governors I just mentioned, some of the senators like Rand Paul, um, reduces the likelihood that, that, that Romney uh, is someone that they think of and think of seriously. Um, the other big winner here, though, is probably Hillary Clinton. Uh, the Democrats are flailing, obviously, around. They, they, they're not sure which way to go, and they're looking for just some direction and someone who can lead them. Uh, Hillary and Bill Clinton are the two leaders of the you know are the two folks who could campaign for anybody and and you know and bring them and bring them some luck and bring them some good tidings in an election uh the polls show that if bill were to run for re-election today he'd get 65 percent of the vote overall um and a lot of people think they'd be voting for him when they vote for her so i would say uh on the republican side you got more candidates now who are available um some fresh names and it's hard to imagine anybody not coalescing or coalescing around the Clintons at this particular moment. So thanks, Dan. Um, if there's any final questions, we'll give uh, you a chance to press one now. As a reminder, that is star one on your telephone keypad to ask a question. All right, then I have a favor to ask everybody. Um, my Twitter handle is at the budget guy. And I have a competition going on with someone in the office in Washington about who's going to have the most followers. So you would all be doing me a huge favor if by the end of the day you followed me at, at the budget guy. And if there's ever any additional questions, the entire staff in Washington is available for you to, to help you out. Let us know. Thanks, Dan. My pleasure.